Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to my practical guide for web development. Now I've done this every year since I think 2017 and it's basically a complete map of technologies that are relevant to web development, at least at this time. And this includes things like languages, frameworks, libraries, tools, and it's a guide for all types of developers from front end to back end to full stack. Now, since the industry has kind of slowed down in terms of, of new technologies, I think that this will be the last year I do a complete guide and then from now on I'll just do like a, a shorter video on trends for the year because what this is is a, is a complete map of all the different languages, front end frameworks, back end frameworks, um, how, libraries, tools, all that stuff um, start to finish. So it is a very long video, it'll probably be lo a little longer than an hour. But bear with me, you definitely don't have to learn everything or even close to everything in this guide. So try not to get overwhelmed by that. Um, the reason I, I do this is to help you kind of pick your path and pick what you want to learn. And also just to let you know what's what, because there's a lot of technologies out there. And when you hear something like, I don't know, Nuxt or, or, or Gatsby, I want you to know what that is. Um, and then you can choose if you want to learn it or not. All right, so before we get started with technologies and, and tools and all that, let's let's take a look at what you want to do because there's a lot of different reasons to want to learn how to code. Do you want to work for a company? That's probably the most popular um, decision is just becoming a developer for a company, applying for jobs. You could also be a freelancer. I started out freelancing. You could have your own business or agency. Um, and what you do can kind of dictate what technologies you learn. Um, you can become a consultant for other companies. You could learn how to code to create your own apps or some kind of SaaS, which is a software as a service to make a little bit of money there. Or you might just want to code as a hobby. So it really depends on what you want to do as to what you should learn. And then you also have the option to be a front end developer where you're dealing with the client side, you're dealing with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, maybe a front end JavaScript framework. You could be a back end developer dealing with building APIs and microservices, data, dealing with databases, or full stack, which seems to be the most popular option where you're doing both. All right, so it's important to know your path and, and what it is you want to do. So let's start off with the necessities, the basic system tools for web development. And obviously you need a computer and an operating system. You can't write much code without that. And as far as hardware goes, web development isn't really demanding on your system. It's not like game engine development or something like that. So you can use a, you know, a mid range laptop or desktop, or even in some cases, a lower end, uh, lower end computer. As far as an operating system goes, I mean, it's it's really preference. There's there's Mac, Windows, Linux. I use all three. Uh, I don't bash any of them. I'm also not a big fanboy of any of them. If I had to choose, I'd choose Mac just because it, I feel like I get a, a smoother experience when it comes to development and just in general as an operating system. But I also use Windows. Um, Windows 10 is much better than previous versions of Windows when it comes to web development. Linux is great. Um, I don't run Linux on my dev machine just because I have software that Linux doesn't run. So uh, I do use Linux for anything that has to do with servers, my home media server, my home web server, all that stuff. And the one of the advantages of using Linux as a dev machine is that it'll most likely match your production environment because most production servers run Linux. So again, completely up to you. Uh, I just prefer Mac myself. So as far as a text editor or an IDE goes, I would definitely recommend VS Code for most cases, most languages. Um, it is, it's, it's very performance, it has a ton of features, it has great extensions, um, it has a built-in terminal. I mean, there's, there's nothing bad I can say about VS Code. It's also seems to be the most popular in the industry. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of people using it. You also have Sublime Text and Atom, which are some other great text editors that I've used in the past. Um, you might need an IDE, so Visual Studio is pretty popular for like .NET stuff. If you're doing uh, ASP.NET, C Sharp, uh, if you're using Java or a, a language like that, a compiled language, you probably need a, an IDE. So you might want to look at Eclipse or NetBeans. I mean, there's a bunch of them out there. And for a web browser, you basically have two really 
uh, respected choices, and that's Chrome and Firefox. And either one of these are, are great. I mean, I use Chrome just because I've used it forever. I, I, there's nothing I can say that's that's bad about it. I mean, it's fast. It, has the, it uses the V8 JavaScript engine. The dev tools are fantastic. Um, Firefox has also come a long way in, in recent years and has some really great dev tools. It even has some stuff that Chrome doesn't. So either one of these are, are a great choice. As far as the terminal goes, eventually you're going to have to get into the command line and learn some system commands and work with CLIs and SSH and stuff like that. Uh, I just tend to go with the default bash edit, um, terminal on Mac and Linux. And if I use Windows, I usually go for git bash, which is a third party terminal that's Unix based. That's much better than the standard Windows command line. Now, Windows does have a new bash terminal, but I haven't I haven't tried it yet. I haven't really even looked at it, so I don't have too much input on that. Um, and then you also have the Windows subsystem for Linux, which isn't really for me. I find it to be overcomplicated, but I do know a lot of people that like it. And then you also have third party terminals like iTerm. I see a lot of developers in videos using iTerm. Uh, Hyper is another one. But I, I myself just tend to stick with the, the, the basics. So for design software, I put optional because not everybody needs to learn this. I mean, if you're working for a company as a developer, you're really not going to be working with the, the UI itself, the creating the design and all that. Um, they usually have teams to do that or at least a, a designer. But if you're freelancing, you may have to create mockups for clients and stuff like that. Uh, I like Adobe XD. I used Photoshop for well over a decade, but switched to Adobe XD because it's it's more targeted to, to, to what I'm doing. And uh, I think it's a little easier. There's, there's also Sketch and Figma, which are pretty popular. I've used Sketch a couple times. I, I believe it's only available on Mac. I could be wrong about that. But it allows you to both of these allow you to create really cool interactive UI mockups. So we may want to check those out. All right. So when you first start learning web development, the first thing you're going to learn is HTML and CSS. These are the building blocks of the web. It doesn't matter how advanced your web app is or what it uses on the back end or what framework is on the front end. It's going to spit out HTML and CSS for the browser to render. Um, so this is definitely what you're going to learn first. Now you want to stick to HTML5. Don't waste your time on XHTML or any of those other derivatives. They're not really used anymore. Um, HTML5 allows us to create really semantic layouts. So before HTML5, we'd have to just use divs and have you know ID of header or, cla or, or classes of header and footer and all that. But with HTML5, we have semantic tags like the header tag and the footer tag and the article tag, things like that. So you really want to learn how to semantically lay out your elements correctly. I would say that's probably the most important part of HTML itself. Uh, most of your time is going to be spent learning CSS because CSS is a lot harder than HTML. Um, you want to learn all the fundamentals, colors, fonts, positioning, learning the box model is really, really important. Uh, CSS grid and Flexbox are probably the best additions to CSS that there have been because before those, when we wanted to align things and create columns and all that, we had to use floats, which absolutely sucked or we had to reach for a framework like bootstrap and use that grid. So definitely learn CSS grid and Flexbox. It'll make your life a lot easier. Um, CSS custom properties are fairly new. I think 2018 they came out. Uh, but they're basically variables in CSS, so they can be very helpful and um, help you to not repeat yourself so much in your CSS. CSS transitions and doing animations. I wouldn't say you have to go crazy with this at first, but I would just learn the basics, learn how to, you know, maybe bring something in from the side smoothly, stuff like that. Um, but you don't have to master CSS before moving on to something else. All right. So responsive design is is very, very important. It has been for the last, you know, five plus years. Most people actually use the Internet on their mobile device, on their smartphone than their computer. So creating a layout that's responsive is very important uh, if it's any kind of serious project and doing it isn't really that hard. Um, you need to set the viewport. You need to create your media queries so you can create a media query so that if the screen is, let's say, 600 pixels or less, which would be a smartphone or a small device, 
then you want to have a one call a stacked one column layout and then if you have a bigger screen size than that you can have two columns three columns and so on you just want it to look decent on smaller screens and you also want it to look decent on large screens like a smart TV um, you want to use fluid widths I would say use rem units over pixels but that's really just preference I just think rem, when you use rem units it's more adaptable for different screen sizes you can also look at mobile first layout um, which is basically where you create your layouts mobile first I mean you, you you create the smaller version first and then you add your media queries to adapt to larger screens I myself don't really do this I mean I have but I, I prefer doing mobile last but it's I mean it's something worth looking at and I do have a couple videos where we build some small templates mobile first if you want to check those out on YouTube and and I also have a 20 hour course on Udemy called modern JavaScript uh, I'm sorry modern HTML and CSS from the beginning so another trend that I'm seeing and I'm actually using myself is to use custom reusable CSS components and I'm kind of moving away from large frameworks like bootstrap and creating my own basically my own mini framework for each project and you can build these reusable components like cards alerts Um, the same stuff that the frameworks offer but you build it in a custom way so it's a custom design it doesn't look too bootstrappy or you know it, it's it's I think it's a, a good way to go you don't have to <clears throat> excuse me import an entire library you can just create the components that you need for that particular UI and SAS which is a CSS preprocessor allows you to do this more efficiently I mean you can use variables nesting conditionals functions all types of stuff to make your CSS more efficient quicker um, you can use the dry principle which is don't repeat yourself if you use like um, inheritance and functions and stuff like that so SAS is definitely a technology that I would suggest learning and it's not it, it's pretty easy to learn I mean if you already know CSS you can learn SAS very very quickly so definitely something I'd look into Uh, and you can actually create separate SAS files for each reusable component and I'm actually going to do a video on this soon um, about using you know modular reusable CSS all right so even with the reusable CSS components I still think it's beneficial to learn a CSS framework um, you don't have to but you, you, you'll probably run into like bootstrap at some point Um, bootstrap is not my favorite CSS framework but I, I would say it's still the most popular so for that reason I would say learn it I mean it's pretty easy to learn and if you learn bootstrap materialize Balma all, these will come natural I mean it's just really it's just really memorizing classes now one framework that I see really really um, gaining traction in 2020 is Tailwind CSS which is a little different than the others and the reason for that is when you use something like bootstrap you have like a button class and alert class for these high level components well Tailwind is a set of utility classes very low level um, classes so that you can create your own buttons and your own cards and and they don't look like everyone else's um, you know you can highly they're highly customizable as far as colors and corners and borders and all that stuff so I think tailwinds is something that um, that's that's really taking starting to take off and will be pretty hot in 2020 and I do have a crash course for that as well all right so once you've learned HTML and CSS and, and possibly a uh, CSS framework The next thing that I'd recommend is learning vanilla JavaScript, meaning just just the JavaScript language, no framework or anything just yet. Um, and even, it really depends on what you plan on doing as to how much JavaScript you should learn. If you're planning on being like an ASP.NET developer or a Python, PHP, or some other language, uh, j you know you don't need to learn as much JavaScript as someone that's going to go into learning React or, or learning Node.js on the back end. Uh, but you still should learn JavaScript because it is the, the programming language of the browser and if you want to have dynamic page functionality you're going to do that through JavaScript you can't do that through Python or anything like that 
So you want to learn the fundamentals, variables, data types, functions, all that good stuff. You want to learn about the DOM, which is the document object model. Um, every element on your page is in the DOM and you can manipulate certain things with JavaScript using events and using um, uh, element selectors and things like that. You also probably want to learn JSON, which is JavaScript object notation. And JSON is a, a data format. And if you're working with APIs, if you're fetching data from an API, chances are it's going to be in JSON, uh, which is very similar to just JavaScript objects. So it's pretty easy to learn. I mean, you could learn JSON in a day. So you want to learn that um, to make requests to APIs. The fetch API is built into the browser. You can use that. We used to have to use Ajax with XHR, which was a pain in the neck. Uh, fetch made it much easier, although I prefer Axios, which is a third party library, and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but you definitely want to learn how to make requests to uh, JSON APIs. And then I'd also suggest learning modern JavaScript, meaning ES6 or ECMAScript 6, also known as ECMAScript 2015. And what that is, if I'm sure most of you guys know this, but if you don't, it was a, a very popular update to JavaScript where it, it, it added a whole bunch of new features, things like arrow functions, template literals, um, promises, things that really just kind of changed JavaScript um, and made it much, much better. Classes. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that was at, that were added in that update. So I would recommend learning that stuff. And if you plan on moving to React or Vue or some kind of JavaScript framework, you really want to master this stuff before you move to that. Okay, so HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you're probably going to need to learn some of these tools as well. Um, I would say Git is something you definitely need to learn regardless of what you're doing, any kind of web development or any kind of programming at all. Um, you should be using version control. So this will allow you to save your work, to version it, to create separate branches when you create a new feature. And you want, you want a place to be able to, to push your code. GitHub is, is obviously the most popular, but you also have like GitLab, Bitbucket, and some other ones as well. But you definitely want to learn Git. It's pretty easy to learn as far as the basics and, and just to, to um, you know, clone repositories, make pull requests, um, and, you know, push to your repo, all that stuff is pretty easy. I have a Git crash course that will show you how to do all that stuff. Uh, another thing that you want to learn is the, the developer tools in your browser. Uh, I use Chrome, so uh, I use the Chrome dev tools, but every browser has its own dev tools that, that do a lot of the same stuff. Um, as far as what you should know, With the dev tools, I mean, there's all different tabs. The elements tab will show you all your HTML and CSS and your computed CSS, and you can edit it and you can make changes and so on. It's, it's good for, you know, creating templates and stuff like that. The console you want to be familiar with, that's where all your JavaScript errors will go. That's where you can do logging and debugging. The network tab will show you your request and response, any data that you get back, any files you get back. And it'll also, sh also show you how it's performing. Um, the application tab in the dev tools will show you like local storage and cookies and stuff like that. So it's important to get familiar with this stuff. Again, I do have a crash course on the Google dev tools um, as well. All right, so VS Code, I put VS Code extensions, but really this could be any text editor or IDE. They, most of them have the ability to add extensions or plugins, and this can be really helpful. Um, I use a set of VS Code extensions like Live Server, Live SAS Compiler, Bracket Colorizer. Uh, when I'm using something like React or Vue, there's, there's specific extensions for those using those frameworks that have syntax highlighting and IntelliSense. So you definitely want to just take a look and see what would make your life a little easier when working in your text editor. Emmet is another great tool. Emmet allows you to write really fast HTML and CSS. I, I use it mostly for HTML, and I don't know what I'd do without it. I mean, I, I'd probably write HTML five times faster with Emmet. And it's built into VS Code. That's another great thing about it. Uh, but if you want to use it with another editor like Atom or Sublime Text, I believe you have to install it as a separate extension. Okay, so NPM and Yarn are both pa uh, JavaScript package managers, and you may not have to learn this if you don't plan on going into like 
uh, using a front end framework or using Node, you'll probably, you know, if you're going to be a Python developer, you'll, you'll use pip for the package manager. If you're a PHP, you'll use composer, but you may have to use NPM at some point. Uh, it's really easy to, to learn. So, I mean, it's, it just allows you to install packages really quickly. Axios is an HTTP library similar to the fetch API. I prefer it because I like the syntax better. Um, but I mean, it's really up to you. It's not something that you definitely need to learn. And then if you want to install NPM packages on the front end, um, you have to use something like Webpack or Parcel, or even if you want to create your own modules, you basically bring a JavaScript file into another JavaScript file. You can't do that by default just with the browser. So you need Webpack or Parcel to bundle it for you. Um, so that, I mean, that's only needed if you're going to get deep into JavaScript, even if you use React or Vue or something like that. Um, they use modules, but everything is done under the hood. You don't actually have to configure your web pack and stuff like that. All right, so now let's talk about deployment, just basic deployments. You should at this point, you should know HTML, CSS and some JavaScript, maybe some tooling like Git in the browser dev tools. So you need to know how to deploy and get your website onto the Internet. Now, I think a lot of people overcomplicate this these days. Uh, when most of us get started and we're building landing pages and these tiny applications with a single JavaScript file, maybe it's a personal site or for, for some small business or something, there's no need to go and learn DevOps and AWS and these really complicated platforms, uh, at least in my opinion. For hosting a, a small site or web app, uh, a managed hosting company like InMotion or HostGator, I think that's absolutely fine. It's easy. It's cheap. Um, you get your email set up very easily. You get uh, cPanel, which is a, is a piece of software to manage your hosting account and allows you to just do everything very easily within the browser. Um, no terminal or anything needed in, in, for, in most cases for some of these smaller sites. You can use FTP or Secure FTP, which is a way to get your your files onto your web host, it is very slow. You wouldn't want to use FTP for something for a really large application, um, but it's fine for smaller websites. The no, there's no need to overcomplicate things. And another fantastic option is static hosting with Netlify. Um, you can get a ton for free and it's really easy to use. You can simply push your code from GitHub or GitLab uh, to Netlify and you can have continuous deployment. Um, they also have a custom CLI that you can use. They give you a free SSL certificate. There's form submission without having to create like a PHP script. So, I mean, I know this sounds like an advertisement, but I can't say enough good things about Netlify. It's definitely, um, it's one of my favorite platforms and I, I think they're really, really innovative as far as hosting goes. So obviously you need to know how to register a domain, which is pretty easily. There's thousands of registrars out there. I prefer Namecheap, but of course you could use whatever you want. And then connecting a domain to your web host is pretty easy. You can just check the docs within the registrar or the, uh, the hosting account. All right. And I know I have SSH here, but it's not really something you need to learn at this point. In my opinion, um, you will definitely need to know it when you get to start creating more advanced apps and you're using cloud hosting and stuff like that. All right. So what we've talked about so far, I would say that you're now a basic front end developer. You don't know a front end framework yet, but you're able to build websites for individuals and small businesses. You can create mobile friendly layouts some CSS animation stuff, maybe create a slideshow, things like that. Work with a CSS framework, possibly add dynamic page functionality with JavaScript, maybe build some small client side applications, use your browser dev tools, utilize Git for version control and deploy and maintain small projects. So if you're able to do all this stuff, I would say you're, you're a basic front end developer and you could start to apply for jobs with this, with this skill set. But chances are, if you're looking to be a front end developer, you'll need to know a front end framework. If you're freelancing, of course, I mean, it, it's up to you. As long as you can fulfill the client's needs, then, I mean, you can pretty much know what you want. Okay, so now you need to pick what you want to do as far as do you want to learn a front end JavaScript framework? 
Do you want to skip that and move to a server side language? I mean, a lot of people will say, especially like hipsters and stuff, will say you need to definitely use a front end JavaScript framework if you want to be a developer. I don't think that's true. I think if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to create, you know, PHP sites or maybe use Python with Django, um, ASP.NET or whatever, if you want to render templates on the server without using a JavaScript framework, I think that's absolutely fine. Um, but there are many, many jobs that are looking for people that know something like React or Vue. All right, so we're going to we're going to get into both of these, but let's start off with the front end JavaScript framework. Now, each of these frameworks have like their own ecosystem, and I'm going to talk about some of that stuff as well. So what we're getting into now is more advanced front end development. Okay, so frameworks give us a lot of um, advantages such as reusable components, a more organized UI, more interact page interaction. Uh, it's better for collaboration and writing clean code. Now, people always ask me which one they should learn. And there's there's actually there's more than this React, Angular and Vue. But these are the three I would suggest looking at because these are the three that you're going to find jobs with. There are a bunch of other ones, but um, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't say they're dead, but it's not they're not frameworks I would recommend. Now, as far as which one of these three, I mean, I don't have a specific answer for that. I have React highlighted just because from my research and from just being in the community, React still seems to be the most popular and you're going to have an easier time finding. Well, I shouldn't say you'll have an easier time finding a job um, because there are a lot of React jobs, but there's also a lot of React developers. So you can't just go by that. What I say is to try each one and pick the one that you really click with, the one that that you understand the easiest. And that's why I created three separate crash courses where we build the same application with all three frameworks so you can really get a feel for it. So React, like I said, is seems to be the most popular. It's fairly easy to learn. I would say it's in the middle. Vue is has really been gaining traction for the past couple years and is becoming really popular. And I would say Vue is the easiest out of the three. And then Angular is would probably it's my last choice. I, I like React and Vue. Um, Angular is still used a lot in like bigger corporations and enterprise level. And I would say it has a pretty steep learning curve just the way it's structured and it uses TypeScript and it's a great framework. It has a lot to it. You know, it's a full framework where technically React is a library, but you know, it's completely up to you. I would just recommend trying each one, building one or two projects with each one and then picking one and sticking with it. All right. So as far as um, other choices, Svelte is, is, is really popular now in, in 2019 going into 2020. And a lot of people think Svelte is a framework, but it's not. It's actually a JavaScript compiler. It works differently. When you run your Svelte code through the compiler, it produces pure vanilla JavaScript, readable uh, JavaScript. When you use a framework, you have a whole bunch of stuff that specifically has to do with that framework. And it's much more bloated than Svelte. Svelte produces readable vanilla JavaScript, which is much lighter and it's very performant. And there's no virtual DOM or anything like that. Now, as as good as Svelte is and, you know, as much as I, I like it, I wouldn't suggest learning it instead of uh, one of the big three frameworks just because it's so new. Maybe my view on that will change in the future and maybe other people have, you know, maybe other people feel it's fine to just use Svelte and not learn React or Vue or something. But I wouldn't recommend using it just using Svelte. I'd say If you already know a front end framework, then get into Svelte and start using it in like smaller projects, personal projects and so on. Uh, but that's just my opinion. But Svelte is definitely something you're going to see more of in 2020. All right. Now, when building a front end app or user interface, a lot of the time we have components that need state. This might be a list of users or maybe you have like a modal component and it has an open and closed state. But sometimes you need app level state so that you can share data across multiple components. And each framework has different ways of doing this. We have libraries that are specifically built for this. And uh, for instance, React often uses Redux, although Redux is completely separate from React and you can use it with anything with something else as well. It's just very popular to use with React. And there's a library called React Redux that connects them both together. 
Uh, for Vue, you have Vuex, which is a state manager built for Vue. Um, for Angular, you have NGRX. However, the trend that I'm seeing for 2020 is to use less of these third party state managers. For instance, React has the context API. And if you use that along with some of the newer hooks, uh, React introduced hooks a little while ago, and there's a hook called use reducer and use context. If you use those paired with the context API, you can get the same effect that you get from from Redux without having to use a third party library. So that's that's what I'm seeing uh, as a trend in 2020. With Angular, same thing, you can use just services. I've actually never even used NGRX. I just stick with services when I need to share data across components. And then Vue, I would say stick with Vuex if you need, you know, if you need something else, because it's highly integrated with Vue and it's made for Vue and it's much easier. There's less, a lot less boilerplate than something like Redux. Okay, and then you also have the Apollo client. If you're using GraphQL, which I know I haven't talked about yet, the Apollo client can also be used to manage um, app level state. So you have a lot of choices. Uh, if it's a smaller app, you, you might not even need anything. You can just put everything right in the, uh, the, the root app component. All right, so we've talked about this, the major frameworks. Now, one huge trend that I'm seeing Uh, in 2019 going into 2020 is server side rendering as opposed to the traditional single page web app that's rendered on the client side because that's by default when you use something like create react app it generates an app that that runs on the client however there there are frameworks like nextjs which is react and nuxt which is vue that basically allow you to to run react or vue on the server And Nuxt is, is basically the same idea as Next, it's just for Vue. If you're new to this, this might sound like yet another overcomplication, you know, a framework for a framework, but it actually makes things easier in the long run because it brings you closer to production than using something like Create React App, where you just where you build the static assets and so on. Um, it uses file system routing, which to me is one of the best features of this. If you're using just regular single page application react you need to create you know use react router and create all your routes and that can get kind of difficult with next or nuxt you can just create like let's say an about.js page and you can just put that right in the pages folder and it'll render automatically when you go to your your app slash about okay so same idea as like php if you create a php file you can just upload it and you can go to that page that's one of the best features of server side rendering another fantastic feature is seo if you build a standard create react app ap application it's hard for for search engine crawlers to actually see the data because it's getting rendered through javascript after the page loads With server side rendering, the content is already there as if it were just a, you know, a regular HTML file on the server. So SEO, if you, if you need um, SEO, I know some applications don't really care about it, but if you need it, server side rendering is definitely something you, you might want to look at. You also have, you know, automatic code splitting, static exporting. You can actually create static sites or generate static sites, CSS in your JavaScript. There's just a whole bunch of, um, Uh, features that you get right out of the box when you use something like Next or Nuxt. All right, so next slide, we're going to look at static site generators. And if this is all new to you, it's probably very overwhelming. You definitely don't need to learn this stuff. My goal here is just to inform you of what this stuff is. And if you're interested, you can take a further look. So some popular static site generators are Gatsby, which is React, and then Gridsome, which is Vue, and there's some other ones as well. You have Hugo, and uh, there's a bunch of them, but I'm going to mostly focus on Gatsby because that seems to be the most popular. So what these do is they, they actually generate static web pages, and it doesn't have to be just like a brochure site or something. You can implement data fetching. Uh, in fact, Gatsby comes bundled with GraphQL, which I know I haven't talked about yet. Um, but unlike the single page applications like you would have with Create React app, with those, they make API requests as you run the app. If, if you use Gatsby, it does all the data fetching from local files during build time. And it's very, very performant. Gatsby sites are, are incredibly fast. 
And yeah, something like Gatsby has a lot in common with Next.js, which we just talked about. They both provide a boilerplate application. They're both performant. They have good SEO. However, Next.js needs a server to run because it renders on the server, where Gatsby is merely a tool that will generate static HTML on build time. Okay, so it doesn't need a server to function at all, much like you can open up a regular HTML file right on your computer. You can do the same with these generated sites. Um, in addition to that, you have different plugins you can use. You can create blogs and directory type content using Markdown. However, you're not limited to Markdown files. You could even use something like a headless CMS, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And Gatsby is definitely gaining more and more traction going into 2020. Again, I'm not trying to overwhelm you with technologies. These are just simply options that you have. Okay, so another uh, huge player in 2020 is going to be TypeScript or is TypeScript. And uh, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, meaning it's, it's everything that JavaScript is, but with some added features. And one of those features is the, the ability to have static types. Because by default, JavaScript doesn't use static types. You don't have to, you know, say that this, this value is a string or a number or anything like that. And even with TypeScript, you don't have to. It's completely optional. But it gives you the option to do that. Um, so you can declare your variables, your parameters, all that stuff as a string or a number, an array, in custom types as well. And TypeScript can be used on its own. It can also be used within a front-end framework like React or Vue. It's by default an Angular. Uh, if you're an Angular developer, you, are, you probably already know TypeScript. And it can also be used on the back end. And there's great tooling for it, uh, support in VS Code and, and other editors. In addition to types, you have things like modules, decorators, classes. Basically everything that's in the, the ES 2015 spec is also in TypeScript. And there's a TypeScript compiler that compiles your code down to clean JavaScript. Um, when you do TypeScript, you have a, your file extension is .ts, and then you compile it down to JavaScript. Now, as far as, you know, learn, wanting or, or thinking that TypeScript is needed, everyone has a different opinion. Some people swear by it, and they don't even write regular JavaScript anymore. And then some people hate it and think it's just a bunch of extra code, and it's, it's a waste of time. Uh, I'm kind of in the middle. I think it's beneficial in larger projects, but I definitely don't think it's needed. I, I don't even think that you need to learn it um, to be a front-end developer, but it can be helpful. It can, you know, make your code more robust and catch errors and stuff before they happen, things like that. So it doesn't hurt to learn it. And it's not that difficult to learn either. So if you, if you know uh, a majority of the stuff that I've talked about, you, you could call yourself a front-end wizard. So if you're familiar with a popular front-end framework, you can build advanced front-end apps or interfaces, have a smooth front-end workflow, interact with APIs and data, manage application and component level state, and then as a bonus, you have you know, server-side rendering with Next or Nuxt, and then static site generation. I mean, this is we've pretty much gone over all of the front-end technologies that you, you might need to learn. All right, so now we're going to move on to server-side. So if you want to be a back-end developer or a full-stack developer, you're going to need to learn a server-side language. And, I mean, I have some languages here that, that you can choose from. Uh, obviously, Node.js is, is not a language. It's a JavaScript runtime. But it basically allows you to use JavaScript as a server-side language. And I have it highlighted because that's, that's what I prefer. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, Node.js is extremely fast. It's asynchronous. It's single-threaded. And it's very fast. And it's, it's very suitable for web apps, um, as long as they're not CPU-intensive, which most web apps are not. Another huge reason that I like Node is because I work with JavaScript on the front end. I, worked with, I work with React and Vue. So having JavaScript on the back end just makes sense to me, having it all be the same language. That's why you see the MERN stack, the mean stack, and, and why these are so popular. They even use MongoDB as a database, which is, is pretty JavaScript-like. 
Um, so I think that, you know, Mern, Mean, Mevin, these are really good stacks to work with. And that's, that's just my opinion. Um, Python is another great language, probably my second favorite language. Python is extremely powerful and, and popular in many areas, of course, you know, machine learning and AI, data science, but it also has its place in, in web apps and web-based tools. It has some really great frameworks, which I'm going to get into, I think, in the next slide. So definitely a great choice. Next, we have PHP, which a lot of people give crap to and it's unfortunate because PHP can be a great language it's very practical it's simple to deploy just about anywhere um, you have Laravel you have WordPress PHP is great for freelancers that need to get stuff out quickly uh, if you're planning on working for a large company PHP might not be the best choice but if you're building if you're freelancing or building personal projects and stuff like that you know PHP can be a great choice it, it just it's become cool to just bash PHP and, and I really don't like that I mean PHP was the first language I learned and I still really like it I don't do a lot of content with it just because more people seem to want JavaScript and, and I, I do prefer JavaScript but um, I think that PHP you know you can do a lot of great things with it and it's very practical so C Sharp is also an excellent choice, especially if you're getting into ASP.NET and the whole .NET ecosystem. It's a great object-oriented language, and the code is usually very clean and understandable. Um, it's, to me, it seems like it's really hard to write spaghetti code with C Sharp, and it's definitely a respectable choice, and I, I plan on learning. I mean, I know, I would say I know the fundamentals, but I plan on diving deeper into C Sharp in 2020. All right, so Ruby is a language that can be used for web development, usually with a framework called Ruby on Rails. And Ruby has really died down in the past five years or so. And I, it's unfortunate. I actually li really like Ruby on Rails. Uh, it's great for rapid development. It's unfortunate that a lot of companies are ditching it. You can still find jobs that use Ruby, but I don't know. I wouldn't really suggest learning it in 2020. But I mean, I also don't want to discourage people from learning it if, if they really like it. So Golang or Go is a language created by Google, and it's a language I find really interesting. I know a, a little bit about it. I've built a couple small projects with it. Uh, it's a compiled language, and it has efficient concurrency, much like languages like C and C++, although it's, it's done much easier. So it's very powerful, and not just for web development, uh, many areas of programming. And it's, it's a, a fast-growing language, and if you like it, then I'd say go for it and choose it as your server-side language. Building REST APIs with Go is, is pretty easy. I've done it a couple times. Um, it does have some frameworks, but the way that the language is structured in the standard library, it's, it, it's almost like there's a built-in framework, uh, at least in my opinion, from what I've used of it. All right, so we have Java, of course, which is an old school language, and I'm not a huge fan of Java. I haven't used it in about 10 years or so. Uh, but with that said, it, it can still be popular in the enterprise world. You probably won't find too many startups using it, but the, um, the Spring framework is, is pretty popular. In fact, I left it out of my 2019 guide, and a bunch of people jumped on me for that. So obviously people do still like it. Now, Rust is... Um, is a bit of an outlier. Something called WebAssembly, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is it's basically a, a binary format that the browser can execute. And it's still very new, but Rust is one of the languages that you can use with WebAssembly in addition to C and C++. All right, so if you plan on getting into WASM, or which is WebAssembly, Rust may be something that you want to look at. All right, so let's look at server-side frameworks, and, and there's a lot of them, so I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly. So for Node.js, you have a bunch of options. Express is definitely the most popular. Express is a minimalistic framework, meaning it doesn't do too much extra for you. It gives you the tools to handle you know, HTTP requests and responses, but it's completely up to you on how you handle those and, and how you build in authentication and stuff like that. None of that stuff is included. Um, on the upside, it gives you a lot of freedom to, to build things how you want and to build what you want and do it your own way. Koa is another very minimalistic framework. It's actually very similar to Express. You have Adonis, which is much higher level and kind of reminds me of Laravel, actually. It includes authentication. 
um, database migrations, all that good stuff. The downside to a framework like Adonis and, and a lot of the other high level frameworks is you don't really see what's going on under the hood. So you don't, sometimes you might not fully understand your application. Whereas with Express, you're doing everything yourself, so you really get it. And if there's a problem, you can pinpoint it. So Feathers JS is a framework that's used for uh, real time data. So like if you're building a chat application or something like that, Feathers is great and it's actually built on top of Express. You also have Nest.js, which is it's very similar to Angular. It uses TypeScript by default. You have uh, components and services and stuff like that. Uh, only it's on the back end. So if you're an Angular developer on the front end, you might want to look at Nest.js as a back end option. So for PHP, Laravel, I would say is the king of PHP frameworks. Um, it's it's fantastic. I think you can build a CRUD app with authentication and get it up and running very quickly. There's also a bunch of helpful libraries you can use. It has migrations. I mean, it's a it's a really it's a heavy framework relative to something like Express, but it gives you a lot to work with and it's very elegant. PHP is criticized a lot for being messy. But if you look at Laravel code, it's actually very clean and elegant. And even people that crap on PHP still think Laravel is a pretty good framework. You also have Symfony, which is funny because Laravel is actually part of it is built from Symfony components. Um, Symfony is a set is just that it's a set of reusable PHP components. It's a great framework, but in my opinion, it has a pretty steep uh, learning curve. Then you have Slim PHP, which isn't too popular, but I put it on here because I like it. And I th and it's one of the micro frameworks for PHP uh, where, you know, it doesn't give you a lot, but it allows you to handle request and response. And then you can do what you want with that, similar to Express. So for Python, you have two awesome frameworks. I have both have both highlighted because I really like them both, but they're very different. So Django is very high level and opinionated. Um, you have to do things in a certain way, the Django way. But in turn for that, in return, you get a lot of features such as authentication. You even get a complete admin panel for your data. So Django is, you know, it's a large full featured framework, whereas Flask is very minimalistic similar to Express and Slim. And it gives you what you need, but you make the rest of the decisions and you have a lot of freedom to do what you want. And uh, I honestly can't pick one of the two. I, I love them both and, um, you know, they're, I use them for different things. So for C Sharp, of course, you have ASP.NET MVC, which is very powerful. You have the whole .NET framework to work with. Visual Studio is a great IDE when you're working with ASP.NET. Uh, like I said before, I don't have a ton of experience, but I plan on learning more about um, ASP.NET and C Sharp. So for Java, you have many web frameworks, the most popular being Spring or, or Spring MVC. I've never used it, but I know people that have that really like it. Ruby, of course, you have Ruby on Rails, which is a, uh, also a very opinionated framework. You have to do things a, very, a certain way, but it does allow you to build things very, very quickly. Um, I would say out of all the frameworks here, Ruby on Rails just is, is this, I guess, the quickest. Not in terms of how fast it is, but in, in terms of how fast you can create things. And then Golang, uh, I don't think you really need a framework in many cases just because of the way the language is, but Revel or Re Reveal, I don't really know how to pronounce it, is one that seems to be pretty popular, but again, I, I've never used it. All right, so when you work on the back end or a full stack, you're going to be working with databases. Most web apps need uh, you know, a place to store data. In many cases, you have certain stacks like the MERN stack, where the M stands for MongoDB. You have the LAMP stack, where uh, one of the M's is, stands for MySQL, so that's PHP, MySQL. So certain technologies, certain languages kind of go, go well with certain uh, databases, but you're not stuck, stuck to that. Like if you use React and Node and all that, you don't have to use MongoDB. You can use Postgres if you want, uh, but just know that there are certain stacks that go well together. 
So there's different types of databases. You have relational databases that have been around forever, and they, they're great for data that where you, you know you have um, data that relates to each other. They use tables and columns, which visually can be compared to like a spreadsheet. Um, I'd say relational databases are the most popular, and they're a pretty solid choice, and you can use them with just about any language. As far as which one, I prefer Postgres just because I find it easy to work with. It's fast. Um, it's an object relational database, and uh, I used MySQL for years, or MySQL, however you want to pronounce it. I used that for years, and then switched to Postgres because I, I don't know, I just liked it a little more, and it seems to be getting a little more popular than than MySQL. But uh, each database usually has a GUI tool to manage it. For instance, Postgres has PG Admin, MySQL has PHP My Admin. Um, even something like MongoDB has Compass, so you have these GUI programs that you can manage your database with, and of course you can log in through the terminal as well. So NoSQL databases are much newer than relational. There's there's many different types of NoSQL. They tend to be used for apps that have uh, just a ton of data. They are said to be more scalable and faster than relational databases, but they do also have their drawbacks. They don't use tables. MongoDB, for instance, stores data in documents, which are similar to JSON documents. Also, you don't have to create all your fields and stuff beforehand like you would with a relational database. You can do all this on the application level, uh, which is very convenient. You know, you get much more freedom with NoSQL, in my opinion. So MongoDB is by far the most popular. It's used in all the JavaScript stacks: Mean, Mern, Maven. Um, you can use it locally or in the cloud with something called Mongo Atlas, and there's a great GUI called Compass that you can use as well.、Uh, Rethink DB is another one that's similar to Mongo, and you also have Couch DB, and there, there's a whole bunch of of NoSQL databases. But like I said, Mongo is the most popular. So you also have cloud databases. Mongo Atlas is a cloud database,、uh, but Firebase is is pretty cool. I really like it. I know some people say it's it's not that scalable or whatever, but I think it's great for smaller to medium sized apps. And it's not just a database. Firebase gives you authentication. It gives you file storage. It's it's basically a complete cloud platform for your apps. It's by Google. Well, it's not by Google, but Google bought them. Um, let's see. You also have Azure Cloud. You have AWS has implementations of cloud databases as well. But yeah, there's there's a whole bunch out there. So you also have ca-、uh, cache and and light databases. For instance, Redis、um, can be used strictly for caching, and it can also be used as a persistent database. SQL Light is great for prototyping.、Uh, if you don't feel like setting up Postgres or something like that,、uh, just to get something out, or you can also use it. As an actual database for really small applications with small amounts of data. Same with NEDB. All right, and in the, in when you're learning databases, if you're learning relational, you're going to learn SQL, which is structured query language. You're also probably going to learn an ORM, which is an object relational mapper, or an ODM, which is an object data mapper, which are basically abstraction layers. So something you know that you'll have in your application. Mongoose is an, is a good example of one. SQLize. Even frameworks like Django and Laravel, they have their own abstraction layer to interact with data, fetch it, and insert, update, delete, and so on. So you're going to be learning that stuff as well. Okay, so the next technology that I want to look at is GraphQL. GraphQL is not something that you have to learn, in my opinion, but it's big enough these days to say that it's a little more than a trend. I think that it's here to stay.、Uh, it's essentially a query language for your APIs. Traditionally, we build REST APIs where we have a bunch of endpoints or URLs that a client, such as the browser,、um, can hit through using, you know, the Fetch API or Axios or something like that, and we can fetch data, insert data, all that good stuff. And a lot of the times, we get more data than we need. Maybe we only need a list of usernames, but the API doesn't permit that, so it, it sends us everything. Which is, you know, obviously a, a bigger data load. So GraphQL is something we can set up so that we have virtually one endpoint, which is the GraphQL endpoint, and we can use a client such as Apollo to make a request to get exactly what we want in terms of data. 
and we do this using the GraphQL query language, which is very simple and looks a lot like JSON. So if you understand JSON, learning GraphQL queries is going to be pretty easy. Um, your queries actually really look like the data that you're fetching. And there's something called mutations when you want to update data as well. GraphQL is very popular in the JavaScript world, but you can use it with, you know, Python and, and many other languages as well. And it's also something you can add to an existing application. So it might be worth looking at. So let's talk a little bit about content management systems. Uh, these have been around forever. You have your your. I guess traditional content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, these are PHP based. You also have like Keystone and Enduro, which are JavaScript based. You have Python CMSs as well. Um, but as far as traditional CMSs go, I would say WordPress and Drupal have been the most popular. Those are the most known. Um, uh, one trend that we're seeing now going into 2020 are headless CMSs. which are different because it's just the data part. Basically, you can build your front end with whatever you want, React, uh, Vue, Angular, Svelte, whatever you want, even like Gatsby or something like that. And you can use a headless CMS for your content. So some examples would be Contentful, Prismic.io, Sanity, Strapi is a, a Node.js based headless CMS. And you can even use WordPress because WordPress has Uh, rest api built in and you can build your front end with react or whatever even vanilla javascript and you can use wordpress as just just as the content management system not as the the front end i guess all right so some stuff you may want to look into cmss are very very handy for freelancers um, that you know have clients that want to be able to log in and create blog posts and stuff like that and a lot of people bash wordpress but There's a huge percentage of, of websites on the Internet that WordPress that are run by WordPress and it's still very popular. Um, so, you know, I don't I don't shit on WordPress at all. All right. So now you know how to build applications, but hosting and in, in hosting a full stack app or a back end app is a bit more complicated than, you know, just a front end HTML, CSS, JavaScript site. So. Uh, especially if you have, you know, databases and stuff. So you're most likely going to have to be pretty familiar with the command line. Uh, you'll be logging into your servers using SSH, which is a secure shell. Um, you might use a password or set set up something called SSH keys. I do have a crash course on SSH to help you out with this. Normally, you'll run your app in a web server environment such as Nginx or Apache. I prefer Nginx. I think it's less complicated. Seem, uh, seems to be a little more popular as well. Um, there's just a few config files you'll need to get familiar with. You'll need to learn how to set up virtual hosts and stuff like that um, if you want to have uh, multiple applications or websites on your server. As far as hosting goes, you have many options. I prefer a, like a bare bones cloud host. Um, which is kind of like just a, an empty Linux container that you can install and do whatever you want on. An example of that is Linode. Linode is great. DigitalOcean, Vulture. These are all cloud-based uh, Linux containers. You also have more, I guess, um, I guess more pre-built options like Heroku, or I guess you could say platform as a service. Heroku makes things easier because you're, you're not responsible for installing and configuring everything. You simply push your application with Git to the server and it handles everything for you. However, it does limit your access and what you can do. Um, I like Heroku for small applications, specifically Node and, um, Node and Python. Then you have AWS and Azure, which are really popular, but they're very large platforms and can be very complicated. Um, they're great for really large scalable web apps. Um, there's also a service called Now by Zeit, and it's pretty new, but it looks promising for Node.js apps. Um, I just hope in the near future they can make the whole process of, of backend deployment easier than it currently is. Something like Netlify is done on the front end. Um, you may also want to look into virtualization and containers with Docker. Docker allows you to install and run pretty much whatever you want in a separate process on your machine inside something called a container. Um, and other people can use those containers and you can have the same environment on multiple machines. And it's really good for teams. What I don't like is when people say that you should always use Docker because 
I think that's bull crap. It's it's just preference. I mean, if you want to run just a local Zamp server and use that, I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, if you're not working with a team, so don't feel pressured to learn something like Docker. Um, I know a lot of the really nerdy types. They want you. To, they just want to overcomplicate things, and uh, and I hate that. And I hope that nobody gets that feeling from this. Just because I'm listing all this stuff, it doesn't mean that I'm pushing it on you. You also have Vagrant, which uh, is virtualization as well. But I would definitely choose Docker over Vagrant. So testing is something you probably want to at least look at. Um, I, I really hate testing, but I do think it's necessary in many larger applications. Um, there are benefits to test-driven development. It can save a lot of headaches in the long run. Uh, you know, unit testing, integration testing, and so on. DevOps um, also consists of things like load balancing, monitoring, security. However, this stuff is usually taken care of by someone else. If you're working for a company, um, you know, a DevOps professional, many companies, the developer won't even touch anything to do with uh, deployment or DevOps. But it's still good to know some of this stuff, especially if you're creating your own applications and your own projects. Okay, so you're now a full stack rock star. If you know, uh, you know, a, a portion of what we've talked about, building user interfaces, uh, including whatever front end technologies you choose, fluent in the server side language and framework, setting up dev environments and workflows, building back end APIs and microservices, working with databases, de deploying to production. So if you can do this stuff, then you are a full stack rock star. Okay, so now we're going to look at some stuff that isn't really required, but it is some stuff you might want to learn. Uh, for instance, mobile development. We have some really cool technologies to build native mobile apps with web technologies. So in the past, we'd have to use something like Java or Objective C or Swift, but now we can build apps with like JavaScript and, and native apps, not not just. Um, web apps that are wrapped in a, a web view. So Flutter is really, really popular now going into 2020. It's an open source SDK uh, created by Google, and it allows you to build and compile UIs to native mobile apps. Actually, it can be used for desktop apps and uh, web apps as well. Now, Flutter does use a programming language called Dart, which is a pretty easy language to learn. A lot of people say it's a mix of JavaScript and Java. Um, so if you already know one language, Dart is pretty easy to pick up, especially for you know what you need for Flutter. And then you also have React Native, which would probably be my second choice. Um, you can build native mobile apps with the React framework. It doesn't use React DOM, so it's a little different in terms of syntax, but the overall structure, the components and stuff like that, if you know React, then you're going to pick up React Native really quickly. Um, native script, you can use a bunch of different things with native script to build native apps. You can use vanilla JavaScript, TypeScript, Angular, or Vue. You have Ionic, which allows you to build hybrid mobile apps with JavaScript. I believe Ionic uses React now by default. I haven't actually used Ionic in a while, um, but I believe that, uh, yeah, it uses React. And then Xamarin allows you to build native mobile apps with the C-sharp language, if you're a C-sharp developer. Okay, so progressive web apps are really popular going into 2020. They're essentially regular web apps, usually built with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, but have a completely native feel in terms of experience and layout and functionality. The idea is to have the mobile experience in the browser, um, and, and you can actually make them installable. So you can install them and have them uh, on your home screen. And there's a checklist of, of stuff that your app has to have in order to be a full-fledged PWA. Um, the first one's pretty obvious. It needs to look great on all screen sizes. Uh, it needs to have a, a, a really native feel to it in terms of the UI. Um, another thing is offline content. So basically, if you're in a native app and you lose your connection, let's say you're in like WhatsApp, um, if you lose your connection, you can still see past messages and stuff like that. With a typical web app, you're going to get that stupid Chrome dinosaur or whatever browser you're using, you'll get the, the a not connected message. With PWAs, you can utilize something called service workers in the browser to cache your content for offline viewing. So this way, if you lose connection, it functions more like a native app. You can still do certain things and it doesn't, you don't just get some ugly error message. 
Um, like I said, you can also make them installable. You can add a splash screen. Um, it must be over HTTPS. That's a strict requ requirement for PWAs. And basically, they're just web apps that are reliable, fast, and engaging. Okay, so we can also build desktop apps with JavaScript using a framework called Electron, which is actually one of my favorite technologies that are available. And um, I, I plan on doing more videos and maybe even a course on Electron because it's very powerful. It uses Node.js and Chromium to be able to build desktop apps with JavaScript. And uh, I mean, it, it, it's, there's a lot of advantages. There's high data security, high performance, accessibility. And when I first heard of Electron, I thought, you know, the apps that you're going to build with this are going to be mediocre at best. But some of my favorite desktop apps are actually built with Electron, including VS Code, which is probably my favorite desktop app, period. Adam, the text editor Adam, also built with, with Electron. Postman, which I use all the time, which is a, um, an API client. Discord, which is uh, a chat application is also built with Electron. So it's very, very powerful and something that I don't see going anywhere anytime soon. All right. So the Jamstack, I actually did a post on Twitter asking for what people thought were going to be trending in 2020. And the Jamstack was probably the, the most uh, answers that I saw. So the Jamstack, for me, when I heard about it, it was pretty difficult to understand. So I'll try to explain it. The J stands for JavaScript, which handles any dynamic programming. This could be any framework or even vanilla JavaScript. The um, A is for APIs. Basically, all server-side processes or database actions are abstracted into reusable APIs. And then M, which is markup, is your pre-built templated markup. And in a lot of cases, this is done by a site generator like Gatsby and Markdown. Um, Gatsby seems to be a very popular option to use with the Jamstack. And we talked about Gatsby earlier, so um, we have Gatsby generating the HTML and client-side JavaScript, and we have an API for our data source and interactions. And the benefits of the Jamstack are better performance. Um, you don't have to wait for pages to build. They're generated at deploy time. Using the Jamstack is also cheaper and easier to scale because our... Um, uh, deployment amounts to a stack of files that can be served from absolutely anywhere. And I, I should definitely mention Netlify because it's a perfect place to host Jamstack applications. Uh, and as far as data, you could even use like a headless CMS as well. So this is all stuff that's pretty new to traditional web development. And I realize it, it might sound a little confusing. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you want to build performant applications using the Jamstack, I definitely suggest uh, looking more into it. All right, so serverless architecture is really popular going into 2020. Um, usually we built when we build an app, traditionally we have a server that's always running that we install, let's say, Node.js on, and we create endpoints to do all of our server-side tasks. Well, with serverless architecture, we can use third-party backends as a service. So we may have some static site that only needs a server for a specific task, and then we can create what's called a serverless function that will do that task for us. So instead of having an always on server, it just runs when we need it to. And this really reduces complexity as well as costs significantly. Um, some examples of third party services are AWS Lambda, probably the most popular, but Netlify also provides uh, serverless architecture. And I definitely prefer Netlify because I think it's, it's much, just much less of a hassle to set up and create your serverless functions and so on. Um, and if this sounds confusing, I do have a video on how to do this with Netlify. So you can check that out if you want to see some examples. But it can really reduce complexity in your application and definitely reduce costs as well. Okay, so another trend that I'm seeing is API first design. And this is just a really a concept, not an actual technology. So we have many different devices and platforms and just the Internet of Things. Uh, we have web apps, mobile apps, gaming consoles, Alexa plugins. Companies are starting to base everything off APIs and microservices and then building from that rather than the other way around, which is what we've done traditionally, where we build a web app and then we build the API to go with that web app. A lot of what I'm seeing now, especially in large companies, is building 
API first and then building a mobile app and then a web app and an Alexa plugin, whatever it might be, around that API or that set of APIs. So AI and machine learning are arguably the hottest trends in software development as a whole. Uh, a lot of times we think of machine learning and web development as separate things, which they are, but they but it can be useful in web development as well. I mean, there's plenty of web apps that can make use of machine learning and neural networks and all that good stuff. Um, you know, it can be used as an alternative to conventional data mining. It can remove, remove security threats. We can build machine learning APIs. We can have machine learning help produce content. We can use it to understand user behavior and, and much more. And obviously Python is the king for machine learning. But even with JavaScript, we have TensorFlow.js. We have libraries like Brain.js to create neural networks and, and do some really cool stuff. All right, so I think that in 2020, we're going to see more speak recognition stuff, particularly on uh, you know mobile-friendly apps to search things. Um, we see it all over the place in technologies like Siri and Alexa, Google. Um, so I, I expect to see this expanding into web applications. And some examples of libraries and technologies that are available right now are the HTML5 web speech API, Google speech to text, um, dialogue flow. There's many others as well. Uh, I'm not talking about a specific technology or library, but this feature in general, I think we're going to start to see more of. All right, guys, so almost there. The last thing that I want to talk about is WebAssembly, which I mentioned briefly earlier. WebAssembly is in, it's still in its early stages, but I think we're going to start to see more of it this year. So traditionally, we use JavaScript to run code on a web page to manipulate the DOM, run some kind of um, calculation or whatever. However, JavaScript does have its limitations in terms of speed. A language like C or C++ is obviously much faster than JavaScript. So what WebAssembly offers is an alternative for some of the things JavaScript does in the browser. Uh, it's an efficient low-level bytecode, and it can be executed by a browser. And it's extremely fast, and it can be generated by languages like C, C++, and also Rust, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Rust is, is a much easier language to learn than C and C++. Um, now, it's not a replacement for JavaScript. It actually works with JavaScript or alongside it. Um, you can almost think of JavaScript as the boss, and then it tells WebAssembly what to do. And it can do it faster than JavaScript would. So essentially, it allows us to use really fast, low-level languages like C++ in our web apps. And this gives us a lot more capabilities. Um, so, for instance, we'll, we should be able to run, like, really... Um, Uh, next level video games and media editing tools and stuff like that right in the browser things that are unthinkable um, you know with just JavaScript so just just realizing that um, I would think this has a, a big future but like I said it's still in its fairly early stages All right, so that's it. I know, I know that was a lot of technologies. This was a long video, so if you if you sat through this whole thing, I, I just want to congratulate you and, and thank you for watching my video for this long. Um, so this brings us to the end where, I mean, I know it's a lot to take in, and my advice is to try not to get caught up and overwhelmed in the sheer amount of technologies that are out there, But take it one step at a time, do some more research and figure out exactly what you want to do, the path you want to take. Um, of course, there are things that you absolutely have to learn, but most of the stuff I've talked about are just options. You know, stick to a language, a framework, a database. Um, don't bounce around just testing. I mean, it's, it's fine at first to learn what you want, but after that, don't feel like you need to learn five languages. It's just not needed. Um, But I just wanted to kind of give you a guide and give you a, a large picture of web development and what's available. Uh, but yeah, so that's it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Uh, if you could follow me on social media, I'd appreciate that at Traversy Media. If you want to take it a step further and support me on Patreon, either a dollar, you know, even a dollar per month, two dollars per month is greatly appreciated. And you get some benefits as well. So that's it, guys. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.